Hello everybody, welcome to Just Nowhere with your host, Dr. Samuel Zinner in the mountain village of Aula in Tuscany, Italy. Tonight we have a very special guest, the physicist Dr. Veselin Petkov of the Nankowski Institute in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Our subjects tonight are the block universe and its implications for physics, consciousness, free will, and the speculative question of what could have brought the universe, especially a block universe, into existence. Now, what is the block universe? Uh, most viewers of this program are probably going to know about the block universe, maybe first from years ago when Brian Green, the physicist, began to uh, speak about this subject right, in uh, various television uh, and modern media venues. And so what is uh, the block world? It's the concept that we live in a, a cosmos of three dimensions of space with a fourth dimension of space-like time where all time points are already there. Right? They don't come into existence right, from a flowing now. Right, so this is also, that would be called presentism. The 4D block world is, is an eternal model. The past, present, and future exist simultaneously and equally ontologically viewed. So the past still exists, the future already exists, but our consciousness is limited. We're only aware of the flowing now, right? We can remember the past, but we might be able to predict the future, but we cannot know it, right? Um, all right, so this is sort of a mind-boggling uh, view. We'll begin with uh, the kinematic effects of special relativity, namely the Lorentz transformations uh, and time dilation, right? So as Veselin Petkov points out in, in his works on the block world, the dynamical explanation right, for uh, the Lorentz transformations right, um, are somewhat inc incoherent, not the best explanation. Right. And so what is what am I referring to, the Lorentz transformation? If you take a meter stick, for instance, this will work with any physical object, but take a meter stick. This is the uh, image that uh, Veselin likes to use. Take, a, take the meter stick and project it right, uh, at a certain velocity and measure the length. Right? Uh, project it at a different velocity, measure the length again. You're going to come up with two different measurements of length. Right, so the dynamical explanation says, well, this is a result of deformation because of the acceleration and velocity. However, according to Petkov, based on Minkowski, the, uh, the, actually the coherent explanation of this is that each of these two measurements are measuring a different 3D slice of the 4D world tube or world line of the meter stick. So, Veselin, uh, could you expand on this point? Assume that the world tube of the meter uh, stick is just a geometrical construction. It does not represent mm. anything in the physical world. Now, what would exist is the three-dimensional meter stick, which would be common to all observers, and no length contraction would happen. Uh, I will come se uh, a few seconds uh, uh, later to explain attempts uh, starting from Fitzgerald and uh, Lorentz uh, to explain uh, length contraction as a deformation mm -hmm. effect. But uh, the main point is here that if exists a single three-dimensional object which is common to all observers because this is the only thing that exists in terms of the meter stick, then all observers in relative motion would share the same meter stick in other words, the same class of simultaneous events, the same parts of the meter stick, which constitute the meter stick, and therefore simultaneity turns out to be absolute in contradiction with the theory of relativity. Now, I know uh, not quite uh, many people uh, recently, but there are people who argue, uh, following the line of Fitzgerald uh, and Lorentz, that the meter stick uh, the, the contraction of the meter stick can be nicely explained as a deformation effect and no such kind of fancy explanation like Minkowski's explanation 
uh, would be necessary. But that attempt needs a single argument. Those people uh, do not take into account uh, that, uh, in fact, uh, not only the endpoints of the meter stick suffer length contraction. Mm. Theory of relativity and more specifically the Lorentz uh, uh, transformation tells us that uh, any two points in space suffer length contraction. And any two points in space, what kind of deformation, what kind of deformation forces you have between two single points in, in space? And uh, they suffer length contraction, but it is nicely explained in terms of uh, Minkowski's explanation. Yes, uh, as you've written then, the two, the two differing measurements would reflect the fact that the meter stick is actually a four-dimensional object and two different cross sections right, are, are, are being measured, right? So, so the, uh, th this is, I think, more systematically explanatory, this 4D approach than the, the deformation or the, the dynamical explanation. And I believe you make uh, an equally uh, persuasive argument that, for instance, time dilation, right? The, the, what's usually understood as the, the, the differing rates of time lapse for two different objects or two different persons traveling at different velocities, right? How to explain this again, um, I think it makes more sense to understand that uh, as an effect right, uh, caused by the reality of a four-dimensional world rather than, again, dynamical forces. But could, could you uh, uh, comment on uh, why the 4D model um, is, uh, explains time dilation better than the, the, the dynamical theories? Uh, first, uh, you said that, uh, let me just return uh, sure, sure, please. A, uh, a bit, uh, you said that the four-dimensional uh, four model represents a better explanation. Uh, yes. let, let me state it uh, as forcefully as possible. More because, bluntly. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. This is the, not my statement. This is Minkowski's statement. Mm. Uh, this is not just explanation. I know philosophers, when they hear uh, for a hundred percent explanation, I, I can imagine what kind of discussion would emerge, uh, would uh, start with uh, yes. all of this. But the whole issue here is that uh, Minkowski's explanation uh, of, of length contraction provides a, a hundred percent explanation. Why a hundred percent? Because if we assume that Minkowski's explanation is wrong, uh, then we would end up with no length contraction because the meter stick, if this is a three-dimensional object, um, if the world is three-dimensional object, this meter stick would be common to all observers. Therefore, they would have a, a common set of simultaneous events and simultaneity for them would, would be absolute. This is a contradiction. So if we assume that Minkowski's explanation of length contraction uh, were wrong, then length contraction would be impossible. Length contraction is indeed impossible in a three-dimensional world. Now, uh, to uh, time dilation. Uh, you said uh, how the uh, four-dimensional explanation is better than the dynamical explanation. Yes. There's no explanation. There is no dynamical explanation. This is just repeating what uh, yes. the Lorentz contraction is uh, are telling us, uh, the, the Lorentz transformations are telling us. Uh, by, uh, by contrast, Minkowski provides, now, now this is not Minkowski's explanation, uh, explanation. This is just extrapolating Minkowski's explanation of length contraction uh, to time dilation. Why? Yes. Uh, because uh, both time dilation and length contraction, a specific manifestation of relativity of simultaneity. The meter stick uh, for one observer, uh, uh, the observer uh, which is addressed 
uh, with respect uh, to the meteoristic uh, has one set of simultaneous events constituting the meteoristic, which is addressed with respect to the first observer. All other observers uh, moving relative uh, to the meteoristic will have a different cross section of uh, the meteoristic world tube and therefore different classes of simulta uh, simultaneous events. Einstein would call relativity simultaneity. Uh, Minkowski does not use uh, this term. Uh, Minkowski's mm, revolutionary view came after he realized that if observers in relative motion have different times, and everything started with uh, Lorentz, uh, in order to, to explain the uh, negative uh, uh, results to detect absolute motion, uh, all experiments captured in uh, Galileo's principle of relativity, and specifically the michelson morley experiment, he introduced a second time in physics, call it uh, local time. Uh, but he didn't take it seriously. He, be uh, he believed that this is a mathematical construction. Uh, years later, he regretted. He said this was my failure. Einstein just postulated the second time and said that both times should be uh, taken, uh, considered on equal footing. Then the third step was made by Minkowski. He said that if two observers in relative motion had different times, therefore different time axes, they inescapably have different three-dimensional spaces. But when you take into account that space is defined in terms of simultaneity, different three-dimensional spaces uh, means different classes of simultaneous events, therefore relativity of simultaneity, what Einstein uh, was arguing. So Minkowski essentially explained everything what Einstein postulated in the theory of relativity, including the principle of relativity, the extended uh, Galileo's principle of relativity, which is the first principle uh, in uh, Einstein's 1905 uh, article, including the constancy of, of the speed of light. So in the same way, time dilation uh, is a result of the fact that if you have two clocks uh, and uh, they, if they're in relative motion, uh, the world tubes would form an angle. They will not be parallel would form an angle. Uh, and the three-dimensional spaces, let's say, of two observers will cut different sections. Uh, and the, the observer, which is addressed with one clock, uh, will measure uh, the shortest time, which is, uh, which is the, called the proper time of the clock. Yes. And the other observer, uh, when finding simultaneous events with, let's say, five seconds interval for the, uh, the clock, which is addressed uh, with the initial observer, then any uh, other observer they, uh, will have their own clock and they will uh, try to find which events on their clock, so which readings on uh, their clock would be simultaneous with the first second and the second second. And this is essentially when their, uh, their three-dimensional spaces intersect the, the world tubes uh, of the meter. As you see, again, this is uh, relativity of simultaneity, simple the manifestation of the fact that uh, different observers have different three-dimensional spaces. Yeah, so this is much more lucid than the dynamical claim that the velocity and mass are actually causing the time dilation, right? So it's, it's very much like the meter stick. Uh, yeah, the, 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 mass, uh, um, the mass is another controversial issue. And if you ask me, I, I would explain a bit. Uh, sure, go ahead. Uh, again, I, I'm just saying that that is a common claim to explain uh, how time dilation takes place, right? Well, it's the faster you go, the, the more velocity is acquired, then the mass begins to increase, and this somehow causes the, the time dilation, just like the deformation, dynamical deformation, supposedly causes the Lorentz uh, transformations, whereas the, the 4D model really uh, explains it more elegantly. Uh, in, uh, in fact, uh, let's keep uh, 
the mass, uh, the, uh, the relativistic increase of the mass uh, a bit separately because you can derive sure, uh, a time dilation without uh, touching, uh, uh, touching the All mass. Right. All right. But again, uh, if we assume that uh, space time is not real, that uh, what would be real would be a three dimensional world. So all observers will share the same space which would intersect uh, the world. There would be no world too, just uh, where the, will intersect uh, the location where the, the clock is. But the whole point yes. is here because I mentioned that the, both the length contraction and time dilations, and time dilation are specific manifestation of uh, relativity or simultaneity. As we said, if we assume that space time were not real, what would be real is a, is a three dimensional world. And this three dimensional world would be common to all observers. Uh, and therefore, as a three dimensional world is defined in terms of simultaneity, all observers will share the same class of simultaneous, the simultaneous uh, events, no relativity of simultaneity, no length contraction, no time dilation. Right. Yes, yeah, so, so the kinematical effects are impossible in, in a 3D world with an evolving time dimension. <laughs> so, this yes. is what I firmly believe Minkowski uh, would express in the strongest term if he were alive. Yes, well, the block world, again, is, uh, it's, it's, it's a th we have the three dimensions of space. And uh, what's unique to this and powerful on this model is that now when I come to time, this is a, let's say some have called it a space-like dimension. In other words, it's not evolving, it's not flowing, just as all points in space are present in the space of Die Welt, right? All points of time are simultaneously present as well in a space-like, you know, analogy. Right? So this, this is the, for most people, the mind-bending uh, aspect of the block world. Uh, so this would mean, as you have written also, right, in a block world, then light actually doesn't propagate. Light doesn't travel. Is that correct? Absolutely. Perfectly stated. Uh, nothing travels, nothing, uh, nothing happens in space-time. Everything is forever there. Uh, if I may, I would, uh, very often I, in my classes, I use uh, a visualization, a, a little bit simplistic visualization, but... Uh, <laughs> of uh, the block universe. Uh, sure. But uh, on the other hand, uh, it helps a lot. At least people get the idea what we are talking about. Uh, now, if one has to compare presentism with time flow, with becoming, with all those things which uh, we believe uh, we are all aware of and they're self-evidently existing, on the other hand, we have Minkowski's approach, space-time. So let let imagine that we're uh, watching a movie. What we see yes. on the screen, a lot of action is happening there. And we worry about the fate of uh, the main character. But on the other hand, we know that everything is on the film strip, forever given. So if one wants to uh, figure out how this frozen four-dimensional world, like the film strip, uh, could present uh, could present us uh, uh, present itself to us like uh, constantly developing uh, yes. story. People should keep this analogy, uh, this visualization in mind, in order to uh, to become uh, in order that uh, for them it becomes easily uh, to try to yes. understand the Minkowski's ideas. And this main question, and I will just go back to you, uh, troubles a lot of people. We see that the whole world around us is not what Minkowski is telling us and not what the experiments are telling us. And this is quite right. disturbing, especially uh, if one hears such kind of claims, 100% explanation, uh, for the length contraction, time dilation. Otherwise, if the world is not four-dimensional, those effects are impossible. So mm -hmm. these are extremely strong claims. And when people hear uh, this uh, 
strong claims, they they would find it very difficult to follow everything uh, that comes after that. Uh, yes. Because this is a really a huge apparent contradiction. According to science, the world is a forever given four-dimensional world, space-time. But uh, there is another fact. Every one of us is uh, aware of uh, themselves at one single moment and this single moment constantly changing. M maybe uh, in order to try to reconcile these uh, two facts, one from science and one from um, our personal experience, uh, maybe this contradiction uh, made uh, Hermann Weil, maybe in the late 1920s, to try to come up with uh, his famous uh, resolution of this uh, contradiction. He said that in, this, uh, in the real world, nothing happens. Everything is forever given. The whole history is given as the world tubes of uh, physical objects. Yes. Only the consciousness, our consciousness crawls up along the world line of our body and realizes the information stored in our brains and incorrectly interprets this in, uh, in, uh, information that what exists out there is an evolving three-dimensional world. It's a very controversial explanation. Now, even mm. some people would say, oh, that's a contradiction in terms. Why? Because everything is frozen uh, in space time. And now suddenly something moves, the consciousness mm -hmm. uh, moves. Uh, it's not that simple. If something is too simple, one should be very careful to try to declare that such a thing is a contradiction in terms. This is an open question because no other attempt to reconcile Minkowski's uh, view of the world with uh, the fact that we are aware of ourselves only at the, uh, the present moment, no other attempt has, at least to my knowledge, has been made. And if this uh, attempt by Hermann Weil uh, is the only one so far and quite consistent with everything, with what we perceive and with uh, the scientific uh, picture of the world, instead of uh, just ignoring, we, we, we have to do more. We have to try to, to figure out whether this is really a contradiction in terms or maybe this is, mm -hmm. there is a lot of depth uh, behind mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Now, this is one of the really interesting consequences of that model that you mentioned with, with, the, with, with Hermann Weyl's um, theory of consciousness. And that is uh, that brings up the subject of of free will, right? And so uh, you've written that it's right. There's no use. There's no use chatting about this subject because, right? If we take seriously that we have a four dimensional world, and it seems uh, from from how you you present this, it's, that seems the only systematically coherent model, right? That's how I would phrase it then th there's simply no room for at least a common conception, the common idea of free will, right? But um, this isn't necessarily uh, totally negative, uh, but there are a lot of people on the planet, right, from the ancient times till the present who actually would not have a negative reaction to the idea right that we don't have humans don't have free will this is the old idea of predestination we find it in in the hebrew bible in the quran right so that that idea has been out there i know Cicero had a very similar idea to to a, a block world i believe uh in non-physics terms but uh, so uh you mentioned uh if i recall it correctly um philosophy of space-time that you and your family live by that makes this absence of free will something that is still actually uh, something that's positive uh, and that actually helps one right, to deal with, with uh, life's difficulties. Could you, could you talk about this philosophy of space-time? Well, if I may, uh, let me start with uh, my personal uh, reaction. Yes. Uh, to, uh, to the implication that there is no free will in space-time. Uh, years ago, when I was in the grad school, uh, my master of uh, sciences in uh, 
was in uh, nuclear physics and uh, in advanced electrodynamics course. And then I realized that there is no free will in uh, such a pitch. And like any normal person, I told myself, no, the world cannot be that idiotic. Uh, yes. I don't care what physics tells me. I know that I, uh, I have free will. But I, I reacted uh, as a young scientist at that time, followed follow the scientific method. And I uh, decided to prove that we do have free will uh, by showing that all experiments which confirm the relativistic effects uh, would not affect uh, the concept of free will. That space-time is really probably just mathematical space. Mm -hmm. Took me months months, frustration after frustration. Uh, and I, now instead of refuting this, I realized very well what Minkowski uh, had in mind. And my respect for Minkowski was growing now at that time. Uh, and I, I realized that those experimental facts, not just theoretical predictions, would be really impossible as Minkowski implied. He never stated explicitly, but as a mathematician, it was there, it, it was yes. obvious to him. Uh, and then suddenly I asked myself, so what, if the world is such, what should I do? Just deny the obvious, what, what is out there? And I started to live with, the, with that idea, to accept uh, the fact that uh, all relativistic effects are impossible in three-dimensional world. The world is at least four-dimensional at the macroscopic level. Uh, and then let's see what follows from that. Uh, and really, as I mentioned, uh, one can find uh, reconciling elements of the fact that we don't have free will. But uh, in parentheses, I would say, uh, in three, as I mentioned, uh, this is a long story, as long as humankind, uh, yes. uh, as old as humankind. Uh, there, there have been philosophers, thinkers, which we uh, argue that there is no free will. Now, in order to make it a little bit more precise, I would say that uh, free will may or may not exist in a three-dimensional world. Then yes. existing arguments even right now, but in a four-dimensional world, definitely uh, there is no free will. Uh, and uh, maybe a little bit extending the parenthesis, uh, I would say that uh, space-time physics, with Minkowski's uh, discovery of the space-time structure of the world, has posed uh, perhaps the greatest intellectual challenge to humankind. We have never faced anything like that coming from a theory. And indeed, if space-time is real, there is no free will. The only way uh, to save free will is to refute uh, the arguments that space-time is real. This is fair, this is science. If you'd like uh, to get to the bottom of that and definitely say that we do have free will, there is no other way. Mm -hmm. uh, the arguments for the reality of space-time, starting from Minkowski's own arguments, should be refuted. Otherwise, it's not science. If, for instance, uh, very often I write in my articles and uh, um, also tell my students uh, that uh, we are entitled to our personal views, but nature yes. does not care about person, yes. our personal op uh, opinions. So in this sense, any discussion of free will without even mentioning uh, the whole intellectual challenge coming from space-time physics, I believe you understand, is nothing more than an unscientific, insignificant chat, which yes. no relevance. This is just uh, exercising in the philosophy of language to talk about uh, mm -hmm. will without even mentioning the greatest threat uh, to, to free will. Yes. Now, directly uh, to your question, at least, again, I would see this um, through my own eyes when I realize that if the world is such and we really do not have free will, what can we do? 
And uh, I remember with my wife, we, uh, we uh, often we go uh, more easily through the difficulties of life. Uh, if we try to come with terms that nothing depends on us and we just sit down or at least walk and try to play our roles, try to watch our life from a distance, not to try to get too involved in everything uh, in the events which are really predetermined, which we cannot change. In that sense, this is one of the um, the positive effects. Of course, there are a lot of implications uh, if one starts seriously to explore uh, yes. this difficult issue of uh, no free will in space-time physics. Yes. Well, what do you think about this, uh, this comparison, uh, which occurs to me when I read uh, your works on this subject? And that is, uh, if we look at what, what Hermann Weyl wrote about consciousness, and the, our experience that time flows, uh, to recognize that that is a misinterpretation right, of, a, of a 4D state, of a block world, does not demean our experience, even though it involves a misinterpretation. So uh, the fact that free will would not exist in a 4D world does not demean our misinterpretation what, which, of what we call this free will. We're misinterpreting it because as you've written and, and many uh, cognitive scientists have written that uh, you know, our unconscious or subconscious really uh, is where the decisions are being made. And then after some delay, we become conscious of this. So our, our choices are actually unconscious. So how can we call them a choice and free? But anyway, the, the, the misinterpretation of this process as free will, right, is not uh, denigrated. It's just interpreted correctly by, by space-time physics, just as Hermann Weyl is not trying to tell anyone that their experience of a time flow is a lie. It's just a misinterpretation right, uh, is, is an incorrect understanding of what is actually behind all of that. So I think for me, if I make that comparison between the two, the misinterpretation of the flow of time and the misinterpretation of free will, then it takes a little bit of the negative edge off maybe for some people. I, I don't know, each person will have to deal with this on their own. But as you say, there, there are immense consequences for fields like the study of ethics, uh, and morality and history and what have you. But um, uh, another uh, thing that comes to mind as well is people in what's called 12-step programs, people with alcoholism problems or other types of problems, right? They have these 12 steps that they're taught. And um, one of the major steps, one of the major techniques is to stop telling yourself that you're in charge. Right. So relax, let go and realize that you're not in charge of things, right? That there's something bigger out there that uh, you have to have recourse to, right? Be it a higher power or however one wants to conceive of it. But the, the principle is stop thinking that you're actually in control. And that actually seems very similar to this idea that maybe we don't have free will. So, I mean, you know, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, so yeah, just in, uh, enjoy your lives. Uh, and if this helps, try to look from a distance. Just imagine that you are playing a role uh, which has not uh, assigned by you, but to you. Yes, yes. And if if we view it this way, uh, you mentioned uh, the example of a movie, the metaphor of a movie. Uh, we could also think, of course, as you've written, uh, of of a writing, a story that's been written as well, right? It's the the whole thing is there from beginning to the end of the plot. But if it's a good story, the spectator will interact with it and get lost in it and start to interact and yell at someone, "Don't do that! Don't do that!" Right? Forgetting that. It, you know, that that's in vain, but it, you know, that's the whole purpose of it, right? Is to lose yourself in it as entertainment. Because you don't have it out there on the film strip. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, this brings me maybe to um, a, a few final points. The first one being this, uh, you, you've written that 
maybe the meaning of life is to be found in uh, our consciousness, right? In contrast to the body. W w uh, could you expand on that? Yes, I would try. Uh, in, uh, in my book, From Illusion to Reality, uh, the last three chapters uh, are more spe uh, speculative. Uh, the first seven are rigorous. Yes. But the last three chapters, uh, uh, I just try to explore the implications of Herman Weil's uh, picture of the world and yes. the fact that we are aware of ourselves at one single moment, which constantly changes. Mm -hmm. And I really, uh, I was careful. I, I knew how people would react if <laughs> they don't uh, uh, read uh, very carefully the, the first seven yes. chapters. Uh, but there are so many uh, implications. For instance, uh, one can ask uh, a lot of questions about who created that picture oh that picture came suddenly with arranged in such a sophisticated ways uh, i mean the space-time picture of the world even i mentioned mm -hmm. that even there is intention uh, implanted in uh, in this four-dimensional uh, picture because if you look at the uh, the world tube of a given uh, person you can see that the world tube acts intentionally on at least apparently intentionally uh, on most uh, occasions. And then other questions, uh, uh, what is the purpose of this? Whether we are just uh, living, uh, realizing uh, all events constituting our world tube, the world tube of our body, uh, what kind of lessons uh, we should learn from this? Probably, uh, we should not try to judge other people when we know that everything is there, nothing depends on them. Uh, also, a lot of disturbing questions, because if consciousness is uh, crawling, as Herman Weil put it, along the world line, how do we know that all world lines of uh, people have consciousness crawling? along their world lines. How do we know that the consciousness uh, uh, of, the, uh, the, of different people are crawling in such a way when, when people interact physically, when their physical uh, world tubes uh, interact, their consciousness is really there. So how do we know that we talk to a, to a person whose consciousness is there? Maybe if, if there is some disbalance and the consciousness of uh, one of the, uh, the people is a little bit ahead, then mm. it's a very strange, like in the, uh, the, the twin paradox, but it's, mm. it, it, it's a very strange story there because it turns out that the, the twins, when they meet together, they talk to just a physical body. The consciousness is not there. Mm. So it's mind boggling. But we should go through, the, uh, through that path, uh, path, try to explore uh, even the craziest ideas. I yes, mean, the first yes. Herman Weil's ideas. Yes, thought, thought experiments, yes, yes yeah. all, all possible ones. Yes, the, well, if I understand uh, Weil correctly, right, we have that the, the 4D block universe uh, is, does not happen. So it doesn't, there's no movement for, as we go back, like for instance, light does not propagate because you know, the, there's, nothing's traveling uh, from that perspective. Only light goes. But, but consciousness is the exception that does move, as you say, along the world tube, the line of the life body. So uh, now to, to get back to uh, maybe your most speculative uh, section in in your book, uh, which you've already alluded to, but I'll, I'll come back to it now. And that is the this uh, concept of when you see this complexity, and let's call it a story or a movie, this, the block world as a movie. So obviously as a story, it's going to have a meaning in some sense, but uh, this is where you bring up the the intuition perhaps, right? That it would seem that that kind of a universe 
uh, is very different from the, the alternative model of, you know, three dimensions of space and one dimension of time that flows and evolves. Contrary to that, a block model universe sort of intuitively makes one wonder, well, doesn't that need some type of, yeah, as you say, creator? And uh, of course you don't expand on that. That's totally understandable. Uh, but what would you think about this? This occurred to me when I was reading that portion of your book. Um, I sort of, I connected it and, and this may be totally mistaken on my part, but I connected it in my own mind with again, Hermann Weyl's one entity that does move and it has this ability to, to traverse the, the world tube of the 4D universe or the individual objects in it. So is, would the, just as a thought experiment, would the one idea to test, if, if it can even be tested, is then would the creator of this 4D story, this 4D movie, this 4D universe, uh, do we have to think of conscious, some kind of consciousness then? Uh, uh, analogical to the consciousness that we don't, you know, that we, as you say, you call it intersubjective, right? It's not objective, but we know other people have the same subjective experience. So is, would consciousness be somewhere to look as some understanding of, of what could create uh, this universe we live in, and, and I know I'm not, I can't ask you for the meaning of, of the universe and answer to this actual question, but that's just a thought that occurred, a question that occurred to me. No, I believe I understand you perfectly. Um, I struggled with those kind of uh, questions when I was uh, writing, especially the last chapter you mentioned. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, because I said that the greatest intellectual challenge humankind has ever faced is uh, space-time physics with the denial of free will. Mm -hmm. But that is nothing compared to this type of questions. Mm -hmm. now, most people could, uh, could say that uh, we don't need a creator in a three-dimensional world. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's it. One can accept that. It looks reasonable. But in space-time, when everything is designed to such a precision, you see the, the action of so many people, people um, as I already mentioned with intentions, all this huge global movie is out there. And it's much more difficult to postulate that just has already been there. Maybe I am wrong, maybe uh, my, is too poor, but I somehow uh, my mind refuses to accept that uh, this has been forever given there, uh, designed the way it is designed. Uh, I can accept, as I said, that three dimensional world was not created, mm. uh, the previous worldview before Minkowski's mm. revolution, but with space time, uh, as you implied things are really, really totally different. Mm -hmm. Well, again, uh, to, to, to recapitulate my point, perhaps a little bit more coherently or, or, or succinctly, it came to me, I think, simply because my unconscious made this association with Hermann Weyl's uh, citation in your, in your books, right? And so maybe if it, seems consciousness can somehow transcend, right? And so maybe a creator also is, if it's transcendent, well, maybe in what way this, maybe has some, is similar in some way to consciousness. But of course, uh, you know, at some point you, you, you enter the domain of philosophy, analytic philosophy, theology, and these, you know, are then beyond the domain of, right? Um, the empirical world, right, and, and space-time, but uh, they certainly seem to be implied in a 4D uh, block world. And so, at least logically and as thought experiments, they cannot be totally ignored. That's yes. how I, I would view it. Yes, and I did mention uh, uh, that implication of uh, Hermann Weyl's idea of consciousness. 
we just uh, you just mentioned it too. Mm. When consciousness grows up the borderline of our body, what happens to the consciousness when we reach our final day? Mm. The and end of the world too. Yes, or separates from the body. It's a legitimate question, and it directly follows from. Herman Weil's idea it simply has to be explored. Mm -hmm. But uh, you outline a lot of uh, difficult questions, and you see this is uh, uh, this is the richest uh, essence of uh, uh, trying to go in depth without fearing uh, uh, fearing that uh, what uh, other people could say, what other colleagues could say, what the general public could say. We have experimental evidence. That experimental evidence has huge implications for our free will. And when, for instance, one tries uh, to uh, explain Herman Weil's uh, reconciliation between this uh, frozen four dimensional world and uh, the other intersubjective fact that we are aware of mm -hmm. only of the single moment, then you see uh, this possibility of exploring. Uh, Herman Weil's ideas uh, opens up so many possibilities, so uh, uh, raises so many questions. Now, yes. so even for that purpose, one should try to do everything possible to, to get to the bottom of uh, the, the question of uh, the ontology and the nature of space-time. That's why Minkowski Institute organizing, uh, is organizing every two years uh, international conferences uh, on the ontology and the nature of space-time. Initially, they started the first three conferences were at Concordia University in Montreal, but then we moved to the famous uh, um, Black Sea uh, Resort uh, mm -hmm. uh, in Bulgaria, near Varna. Yes. Uh, discussion. Yes. Do you have... Uh, do you have uh, participants, right, who are experts in, in ethics and philosophy, because it seems, of course, there are those implications. Yes, uh, we, uh, we did. Uh, usually our conferences uh, uh, are being attended by people from all over the world. At the last conference uh, uh, in September, uh, we had uh, two people from Japan, two people from Australia, from Europe, from uh, uh, from uh, the United States, we have special sessions uh, mm. on uh, the nature of time uh, and from different perspectives. We have even uh, people from religion, not the last, uh, not at the last conference, but at uh, previous conferences. Yes, we, well, yes, excuse me, please go ahead. Uh, in fact, uh, anyone from different uh, uh, branches uh, which uh, can see relevance uh, to their research uh, with uh, the, the implications of space-time physics, they come and we discuss and it, mm -hmm. it's an unbelievable discussion. You know, on the other hand, you can see uh, philosophers of uh, physics, of science, uh, philosophers, uh, uh, people from uh, theology. It's mm -hmm. an unbelievable mixture of ideas, exchanging ideas. That's fascinating. Uh, w one final question, if I may indulge you. Um, I didn't notice this particular point in your book. I may have overlooked something, but the thought occurred to me, if consciousness is uh, able to move along the world tubes uh, uh, in a block universe, well, the story, the, 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 the story that is the block universe, a part of that story, is this movement, right, of consciousness. So let's say when the consciousness reaches the end of a particular world tube of a, of a human being, for instance, uh, we may not be able to figure out what happens after that, but we, we can know that that particular uh, trajectory, that movement of that consciousness along that world tube remains part of the 4D movie, the 4D story. And so, in a sense, um, it's, it's, it's an old uh, philosophical trope, right? That I'm always being born, I'm always dying, right? From this 4D eternalist 
perspective, right? So, but um, the consciousness may not be experiencing this or that anymore, but that story is still there. It's part of the movie. So in that sense, there is that type of immortality for sure. Uh, does that sound coherent? Yes. Uh, I believe uh, you described it uh, quite properly. Uh, if it uh, should be stated in a single sentence, uh, as uh, the whole world tubes of human human beings are forever given in space time. So in that sense, there is no birth, there is no death, everything is there. Yes, yes, which is, uh, I think, even Einstein, right, consoled uh, one of his friends uh, at, a, at the death of her husband, I think it was, that, uh, you know, with this 4D yeah. model, which he seemed to be supposing at that point, this, which is essentially Minkowski uh, block world, that, uh, you know, he realized that the experience or the belief in uh, a past, present, and future as such, right, with a flowing time is, is a, I forget how he phrased it, a stubborn, stubborn belief, illusion. excuse me? Stubborn illusion. Stubborn illusion. There we go. Yes, yes, yes. And and so uh, uh, and and then one final question that you also wrote about. <clears throat> Since I was left like on a cliff hanging <laughs> because of the date of your book on illusions to reality, and that is you mentioned Sam Parnia, a medical doctor. His uh, research is so-called near near death experiences, and <clears throat> you were waiting awaiting some medical uh, test results, right? That were supposed to be published in 2013. Uh, have you ever followed up on that? Or, or is there anything that you learned subsequently? Uh, in fact, uh, in recent years, um, in the last uh, four or five years, uh, my research has been uh, more on uh, general relativity, on uh, curved space time. All right, fair uh, enough. It takes a lot of time uh, of my time, but at that time, uh, several years after the, uh, the publication of the Airframe Illusion, uh, Illusions to Reality, uh, I tried to follow, uh, but n uh, no breakthrough. It seems uh, mm -hmm. there have been simple, uh, single documented cases of uh, um, near death experience. And I, uh, I believe. Uh, uh, you notice that I was extremely careful uh, when yes, I tried yes. to, to connect these two things because, uh, as I said, it's a totally legitimate question. Uh, what yes. happens to consciousness when uh, it reaches the end of uh, a human being's uh, world mm -hmm. life? And yes. the only thing that resembled uh, the scientific research was specifically uh, that research project, uh, which was funded, officially funded, I believe, by the, the British government. I might, yeah. I might be wrong because it was many years ago, but it's uh, quoted in the book. Uh, and it looked to me, this is the only uh, scientifically reliable research that one can refer to. That's yes, point. yes, yes. Well, uh, yes, I agree with you. It's totally legitimate because Parnia was focusing on uh, anecdotes or stories uh, that seem credible, right? That uh, people in this near death state had seen objects, as you said, that were only visible from above their bodily position. And, and there are other stories, right, that, uh, that I've heard that seem credible that uh, people knew what people were saying to each other out in a hallway, right? Waiting to learn the fate uh, of their loved one. Uh, but that seems totally legitimate. The 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 a lot of the other parts of the near death experience uh, seem very dreamlike. They have uh, experiences, and it seems very like it could be a symbolic language. So, uh, what seems scientifically interesting are are the other elements to be able to see certain objects and to see one's body above the body. It's very intriguing. But yes, yes, you were very careful, and and, and rightly so. Well, with that, um, I, I want to thank you so much, Rosalind. This has been very enlightening, and I'm, and I'm sure it was enlightening for our audience. And I thank everyone for joining. And I'll have a link to uh, some of uh, Veslin's books down in the description for this video. 
the one on illusions realities is actually a PDF you can download free. Fascinating. Again, thank you so, so much, Vaseline. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome.